was a July midnight, and from out A full orbed moon, that, like thine own soul soaring, Sought a precipitant pathway up through heaven, There fell a silvery, silken veil of light, With quietude and sultriness and slumber, Upon the upturned faces of a thousand, Roses that grew in an enchanted garden. Good morning, co-fans. We're recording a little bit differently today than we normally do in the evening. And part of the reason is we have extremely special guests, our brother and sister podcast, podcast. Beyond the Oblong Box with Virginia Poe and Levi Leland. Welcome, guys. We're so glad you're back. Hi. Thank you for having us again. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Yes, we have so much fun with you guys. Yeah, we do. So we thought to for this particular degree, Poe Places, you know, there's there's several we can choose from, but we like to kind of at, at first, since we did uh Ireland last year, we decided to pick up and do Rhode Island this year because not a lot of people know about Poe's connection to Rhode Island. And we just thought that it was just a good year to do this. And so we're going to kind of talk about a little bit of the history first and then talk about really get down to why did Poe go to Rhode Island for the reasons he did. Right. So Jeannie, do you want to introduce kind of a little bit about the history or do you want me to start? Oh, I can do that. That'll, okay. that'll be my little contribution this morning. <laughs> First of all, I want to start out to say that Ireland is an island and Rhode Island is not. Rhode Island is actually a part of the contiguous United States, <laughs> but it got the name. I don't know how, but it just kind of weird. Rhode Island, but it's not an island. However, what's really in for, you know, informational for me when I used to teach United States history and the early colonies was how Rhode Island became a colony. And it was founded by a Puritan named Roger Williams, who got ousted from the Puritans in Massachusetts. They were snobs. They didn't like how Roger didn't agree with how they treated the Native Americans. However, Roger was like, I'm not going back to England. You can't make me. And he ran down to Rhode Island. Well, he probably didn't run, but, you know, they they at least walked because they didn't have cars. Walked Um, briskly. Yeah. (laughs) And and anyway, that uh, Rhode Island started becoming a, quote, unquote, dumping ground for those Puritans that didn't fulfill their puritanical beliefs the way they should and got kicked out. So Roger Williams right. decided, hey, I'm going to call, you know, colonize this area for all these rejects or and all these people that have differing ideas that actually want to treat people normally and give the Native Americans their due without treating them horribly. But unfortunately, that became the name of Rhode Island first as the sewer. So... And I think that was coined by that. Cotton Mather. I think that was who actually said that. Whoever said it, they <laughs> definitely did it. Because so, they yes. set them all down there. <laughs> Every time they kicked them out of the Puritan colony in Massachusetts, they just kicked them down to the sewer in Rhode Island. And then one of the females, I know we're going to be talking about Sarah Whitman, but one of the female, um, Anne cannot remember her last name I believe it was taylor um but anyway in history she was a voice that wanted to speak out in the puritan belief system because she did not like being cowed and not being able to speak her mind and so she actually went in front of the puritan courts and the puritan's court says nope get out and so she got kicked out but she actually ended up in Connecticut. She started in Rhode Island, but then she traveled down to Connecticut. But strong women is what I was going for gotcha. because I know Sarah Whitman and Levi is probably going to expound upon this a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But she was very much one of those uh, that had a voice. So mm-hmm. yes. without further ado, yep. take it away, Levi. 
Yes. <laughs> well, that was a great concise history, Jeannie. Um, and I'm happy to be recording uh, live from the sewer. Um, <laughs> Rhode Island is my home. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't stink. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's lovely. No, it's nearly lovely. That, yeah. <laughs> Carmen can attest it's yes. not that bad. Um, uh, so Rhode Island, you know, I was born and raised here and, um, this is kind of a fun episode because not only do I do the podcast with Virginia, but I also kind of made it my life's work, uh, especially in Poe to highlight his time in Providence, Rhode Island, my home state. Um, you know, after being a, a pretty dedicated Poe fan for like more than half my life now, uh, I <laughs> realized within the last like five to six years that, you know, well, Poe was here. Poe is here right in Rhode Island where where I live and have lived my whole life. And Rhode Island kind of needed a spokesman for Poe's time here. I mean, when you look at uh, Poe studies today. You have Boston, Massachusetts claiming Poe as their own. You know, he was born there, rightfully so. You know, his his mother wrote on on that little miniature painting of the Boston Harbor, you know, mm -hmm. you know, for my little son Edgar should ever love Boston, the place of his birth and where his mother found, you know, her most sympathetic friends. And so, you know, Boston has that claim on Poe and and he hated Boston and Boston hated him in, <laughs> you know, but today it was if, the feelings were mutual. Yeah, the feelings yes. were totally yes. mutual. Yes. Um, and again, you know, his parents were just kind of passing through Boston for work when he was born there. So mm -hmm. other than that, the connections are really loose, but today you have, you know, this big focus on Poe in Boston. And then of course you have Poe in Richmond, Virginia, which they have a, a better kind of bigger claim, of course, you yes. know, so, there yes. was a time it was at, you know, UVA. And, <laughs> right. You know, and you so pretty much grew up There's in a lot Richmond. of the family yes. still in Virginia. Yes. And he was saying, married in, in Richmond. So yep. there's all well, the things. Okay. Go yeah. Ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I'm just going <laughs> to. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of. Drinking tea. Um, and of course, they have the museum to Poe in Richmond, and and Boston just erected the statue to Poe within the last decade or so. I think it's been, and um, you know, and so you know, outside of Richmond, you have uh, ba Baltimore, Maryland. Of course, they have the biggest claim on Poe. Um, he's buried there. He died there, but he also lived there for a brief time. Is the the Poe his paternal side? The Poes were from Baltimore, mm -hmm. um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They they claim Poe today. There's a museum there as well. Um, there's a museum in Baltimore, you know, which were his actual houses, uh, as opposed to Richmond, Virginia, where that museum wasn't his actual residence. He never lived there, but yeah. it's the oldest house in Richmond, and they house the mm -hmm. most extensive the collection collection yes. of of his personal yeah. items and artifacts and photographs and and um. But Philadelphia claims his body of works, which is kind of an interesting concept. But yeah. he wrote mm -hmm. his most prolific works while in Philadelphia. Well, so. You yeah. know, they kind of say, well, Philadelphia inspired the most, you know, Poe's greatest hits. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then of course, I, I feel like I'm missing. Oh yeah, uh, the Bronx. Bronx, at, yes. At that time was Fordham, you know, that saw his final residence. And of course the Raven was published in New York, which was huge. And mm -hmm. uh, Virginia died in Fordham, New York. Yes. And today mm -hmm. the cottage in which she died in is still, you know, up and running and that's a museum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all these geographic, graphical places, even South Carolina, Charlestown, you know, yes. uh, they claim they have that little slice of Poe because he was stationed there for a brief time. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some connection to the gold bug there, which they think it might've inspired that story. And, you know, so these little geographical slices of Poe's life are shown in these little states mm -hmm. and these cities and they, they claim him. And, and I kind of was realizing like, well, what happened to Poe in Providence? You know, Poe was yeah. here and it, it wasn't for a long time, but I can't imagine it was any more or less significant than his time in Boston or his time in South Carolina. Like, why can't we claim Poe? So mm -hmm. that's what I made it my mission. I'm like, you know what? This is my new focus and, and this is going to be my niche in my, my Poe fandom. And so I just went to work like uh i i visited the sites i did so much research i went to you know the brown university libraries to to look at sarah helen whitman's papers and her um you know 
personal effects to really get a sense of, you know, what, what's the history here? You know, what's, yeah. what's, what happened, you know? And I've, I kind of discovered that Providence has quite the story to tell when it comes to Poe, a hundred percent. And so that's when I made the website, edgarallanpoeri.com. I kind of use that as like my, my dumping grounds, you know, of all the research I was doing. I just wanted somewhere to put it all, you know? And so it's your personal sewer per se. It's my, yeah, per, I was just going to say, it's my personal <laughs> dump. It's the sewer of Poe in Providence. Oh, that's, that's very what it apropos. Oh. It's very apropos. Ah, it's, uh, there it is. <laughs> There we go. It, yeah, oh, it's um, we have and truly I, begun. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. It it it's been a, a passion project for sure. And then, um, within the last like three years, well, I I debuted my tour, my walking tour, which is kind of like the the yes. that was the accumulation of everything was the walking tour. And Carmen has been yes. on it. It, she, it is amazing. <laughs> she loved it. <laughs> yes, amazing. And we even had uh the was it Brown, Univer Brown oh. University's graduation? Yep. We were able to, you know, go around all of that, still got to go to all the locations. Yep. And it was a beautiful day. It was a hot day, but beautiful mm. day. And if you are ever in Providence, you need to take Levi's tour. It, it you Thank will learn you. so I much. Appreciate that. You will learn so much. It was, it was so much fun. Awesome. Yeah, I did have a lot of fun on that one. And it's always yeah. fun to share it with somebody that really has a passion for Poe and understands like how um, important some of these parts of his life really were and, and they mm -hmm. can see that. And so, you know, through this endeavor, I've also kind of highlighted a rather underrated character, in my opinion, in Poe's biography. Yes. Um, Sarah Helen Whitman, of course, mm -hmm. you know, she's flown under the radar, in my opinion, for pretty much all of Poe's studies. I mean, a few yeah. people have really highlighted her in, in some papers and some works, but when you read the general Poe biography, um, it really just kind of, she's a footnote, you know, but yeah. her work in Poe's life and his legacy was insane. I mean, if it wasn't mm -hmm. for her, we probably wouldn't know nearly as much as we know about Poe during that time of his life. Absolutely. And, and a lot happened during a lot, that time. Oh, a lot yes, happened. <laughs> a, a ton, you know, and, and he shared with her things about his childhood and, and some of the mm -hmm. things that, um, about his marriage to Virginia and, and things mm -hmm. that I don't think he really shared with anybody else. And she, instead of, you know, being kind of bitter after the relationship and just kind of yeah. being done with it and wiping her hands of it, like some of the other Poe women did, <laughs> she decided, no, I'm actually going to use this information and I'm going to publish it i'm going to write about it i'm going to make sure that people know the real poe you know and, yeah. and she staunchly defended his reputation after griswold totally s smeared him you know mm -hmm. um and <gasps> and, it, and it wasn't convenient for her to do so either that's that's the other thing too it's yeah. not like you know she was a poetess she was an essayist she was a critic a literary critic mm -hmm. and so you know her reputation kind of depended on what she published and what she wrote and yeah. the overall consensus on Poe at that time, especially, especially after his death and even his later life was, uh, you know, rumors, scandal, um, you know, his drinking, all these really negative things. So it wasn't totally convenient for her to stand up and come to his defense, but she did it and to her, to her dying day. And yeah. so we kind of owe her so much uh yeah. in that sense so that's kind of like the the teaser that's 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 how yes. i advertise it <laughs> um, but of course the story starts from beginning to end <laughs> there's there's it's 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 crazy it's it's insane it, it it total it totally is and she was just a phenomenal uh lady and so intelligent and it, it was it's almost like she and poe were like almost the the female male of each other, you know, the yeah. very similar, just when well, you and reasons. I talked about that on the tour. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say, Virginia? I said, there's reasons for that. Yes, yes. exactly. And <laughs> so, big reason. <laughs> yes. And I think Vir Virginia, you're drinking a, a tea oh, today. I'm not and spilling it. I'm drinking it. <laughs> Well, I guess we are kind of spilling the tea. Yeah, yeah, kind um, of. Oh, I think there'll there'll be some tea spilled on this episode for sure. Yes, oh, yes, yes. 
Well, yeah. it's going to the right spot. We're talking about the sewer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. Oh, <laughs> Jeannie Smith, ladies and gentlemen, she'll be here all week. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my no, goodness! No, um, actually, in in honor of Miss Sarah, who I admire greatly, because um, I I myself, she was very well known for her gardens, and I love gardening which most people don't really know about me but I am and I'm a big um, I'm a big rose girl I've always been a rose girl my dad grew roses and I love roses and I have three beautiful bushes that I really hope mother nature hasn't killed with oh. our recent 20 degree weathers cross my let's, fingers yes let's keep but, your fingers uh, crossed fingers crossed but um, I, I am drinking some very lovely um, St. Valentine tea from my beloved Jolie Tea Company just up the way in Salem, Mass. It's not an advertisement for them, by the way. It's just <laughs> fabulous freaking tea, man. I'm telling you. And it's black rose tea. Ooh, and I thought that, that would be appropriate good. to drink while we talk about Miss Whitman. So Levi, please, please, uh, please tell the story. Can you tell us the story <laughs> again about right, how so Eddie first Levi's story tell time. Us the story. Levi's story <laughs> time. Uh, so I do love this story. It, it is. It's just. It's, it's so beautiful. It's it's beyond beautiful. Yeah, it's oh. amazing. Yeah, it's oh. I the the romance between Paul and Whitman was unlike any other I think in his life because it it's like a movie it everything that mm -hmm. happened is was just like you couldn't have written a better romance tale you know and it but except it was real life it was actually happening so um in 1845 uh it was July a hot summer evening in 1845 Poe first visits Providence in his lifetime um, and now he had just published The Raven earlier that year in January. So he was becoming well known. He was really making a name for himself. And, you know, his mark on literature was pretty much solidified at that point because The Raven was so famous. And he began a, a friendship with Frances Osgood, which was another literary lady in his life. And there's a whole, you know, story that goes with that for a whole other podcast. But yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Francis Osgood <laughs> invites Poe to Providence. Uh, she's lecturing uh, before the Franklin Lyceum Club uh, mm -hmm. at Howard's Hall. And so she in invites Poe to come see her, you know, hear her lecture. So he gets on the first train from New York. He comes down to Providence and attends the lecture. And so afterwards, the, the two decided to take a walk along Providence and, you know, especially the east side. Um, and so walking arm in arm, it was about midnight. And again, it was hot. It was sultry. It was just a very, very warm, humid night. And so mm -hmm. they find themselves on Benefit Street and they're traveling north. And as they approach what's now Church Street, the little hill that goes down right on the side of Whitman's house, uh, Poe stops in his tracks. He glances down into the backyard of Whitman's home, which was right there on Benefit Street. Mm -hmm. And he sees this woman. She's clad all in white. So Whitman wore all black in the wintertime, and she wore all white in the summertime. That was, that was her attire. So it was summer. It was hot. She was wearing all white, shawls, a veil, a muslin dress, um, and it, there was a full moon out and the moonlight was illuminating these garments in the pitch black, of course. And, and they're kind of floating in the warm, humid breeze. And Poe is just mm -hmm. taken back. You know, it's like he's seeing the most beautiful ghost he's ever seen, like a woman from his own tale, you know, yeah. from one of his own tales. So she's tending her rose garden in, in the middle of the night, which she often did and which a lot of people often did virginia might be able to attest being a gardener herself that on a <laughs> hot hot night like that you'd want to keep the plants hydrated throughout the night so she was, yep. she was she was doing that you know some people ask me like why was she out in the middle of the night watering her roses you know why was she sleeping well no that's what she was doing so um they time to do it yeah francis osgood yeah. of course notices poe looking at Sarah Helen Whitman and because Francis Osgood knew Sarah Helen Whitman, 
she offered to introduce them right on the spot. Mm-hmm. But Poe adamantly declined an introduction right then and there. He almost so aggressively that it started a little quarrel between him and Francis Osgood. That you know, it was like, no, 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 I don't want to be introduced. Like, let's just keep keep going. So mm-hmm. um that's what they did. They continued on their walk. Um, but Sarah Helen Whitman would leave a perpetual mark on Poe's mind a hundred percent over the next three years when they would finally begin their romance. Mm -hmm. Um, it's important to remember that in 1845 and and when poe first saw whitman he was still married to his wife virginia um and when francis osgood had introduced or 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 not introduced but had mentioned whitman's name to poe um she addressed her as mrs whitman so Poe had also thought that she was married, and this could be why he was so adamant about not being introduced. He didn't want to get tangled up in some kind of, you know, in in, in a in, into a married woman, you know. And uh, what he didn't know was she she was in fact widowed. So, you know, she was widowed in 1833, uh, quite a while prior to that. And um, she just had kept, of course, as widows did, they kept their last name and still addressed themselves as Mrs. So, mm-hmm. um that could be why he was kind of, you know, shy at, at, at that night. Um, yeah. And three years later, of course, was when now at this point, you know, Virginia had passed away in 1847. So Poe was kind of on this desperate hunt for a female companion, as as we know, and a lot of Poe fans know that those years after Virginia's death, he was just chasing women you know any any female figure that could was giving him any kind of attention not even necessarily romantic attention just tender caring kind of attention um he was just you know uh captivated he just he needed that type of affection in his life um and so sarah helen whitman was um, asked to submit a poem to a Valentine party uh, and one of Anne Lynch's Valentine parties. And so she submitted a poem to Poe, a Valentine. Um, and everybody discouraged her. Anne Lynch, other of, you know, other members of the literati were like, no, don't, don't write one to Poe. He's not invited because at this time <laughs> he was shunned <laughs> as yeah. we know. Aww. It was just those, those, it's, it's crazy. I feel like it was like the first time Poe came to Providence, he was at the prime of his life and the height yeah. of his career. And then by the second time he came to Providence, he was just an outcast and everything just kind of fell apart for him, which is so sad. But um, yeah. it still didn't stop Whitman. You know, she was like being the very strong, independent woman that she was that, you know, she was like, no, I'm writing a poem to Poe. I admire his work. I admire his genius. I'm submitting this poem to Poe. Yeah. So she submitted the poem to the Valentine party, um, but they didn't read it. <laughs> they didn't read it because they just, <laughs> Poe wasn't, not only was Poe not invited, but they also figured it would be in everybody's best interest to not even acknowledge him at this party and any poems that, you know, were addressed to him. So that's why Sarah Helen Whitman had then published the poem herself in the home journal to get, to get it out there, to say, I wrote this tribute to Poe, and he deserves to see it. And so that's what she did. <laughs> <laughs> that That is so cool. And one, one note I, I remember from the tour that I, it just really resonated with me kind of going back to the story of the Rose Garden. There are roses still growing there. There are. There are roses yeah. still in that very spot. Yes. Um, I like to think, and it's kind of, you know, local lore that they are the uh, descendants of the very roses that yes. she gardened herself. You know, roses mm-hmm. always come back wherever they are yeah. planted. So, yeah. um, you know, that's that's what I like to think, and that's what I like to believe. It's possible that more could have been planted, or you know, some of them aren't the originals, but I think right. some are. I think some of them did end up coming back. So, I, you, I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. When you walk by that very spot, you can take the same walk that Poe took that night and yeah. you can look down and you can still see a rose garden in full bloom in July. And it's quite a a sight. It's it's yeah. really you're you're living in that history and you're living in history in that very moment, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think Levi, you have never gotten to go in the house, right? No. So that house, unfortunately, it, at the time that Whitman lived there, it was, you know, a two family house, but at that time, two families weren't like two separate apartments there. Mm -hmm. They were, it was an open floor plan, but each family had their own living quarters on their respective ends of the house. Mm -hmm. Um, but around 1950, they were divided up into five apartment units. So the okay. house is still there. Uh, it's said that some of the, the interior is still original, like the woodwork and uh, some marble fireplaces that were are still in there that were original. Yeah. But unfortunately, I've never been able to go in there. It's actually owned by the Episcopal Church, which um, St. John's, which is located right in down the hill. So if you have, you have Whitman's house, then you have the Rose Garden in the back, and then further back you have St. John's Church and the adjoining mm -hmm. churchyard, um, which they I frequented. Think. And Sarah Helen Whitman frequented that graveyard uh, during her time in the house. Well, and that that's what I was going to ask next is tell us about kind of after her poem was published, what happened after that? Yeah. So with them. Poe, of course, sees this tribute and Poe being Poe was like, all right, you know, I got her. <laughs> I got her in the bag. <laughs> um, so, you know, he remembers Sarah Helen Whitman in Providence and and that he that's the same woman he saw in the Rose Garden that Francis Osgood had mentioned to him. And and so he's just um, taken back by this unsolicited attention because it's not like he was trying to get her attention. Right. At, at this time, she just yeah. mm -hmm. happened to publish this tribute to him. And mind you, she didn't know that he had saw her three years prior walking by her house. She had no idea. Mm -hmm. So this was just yeah. all very coincidental. And mm -hmm. so he, in response, he, he goes to one of his published editions of his poetry and he tears out the poem to Helen. But of course, that was to Helen Stannard, his, right. uh, you know, the mother of his childhood <laughs> friend. So it was just very convenient that they bore, you know, it bore her nickname because a, a lot of Whitman's friends called her Helen and then Poe mm -hmm. would call her Helen throughout their romance. So this was very convenient for him. He didn't have to write a new poem. So he tore it out. He sent it to her anonymously. He didn't sign it or anything. And so she received the poem and that was about it. She was probably, you know, she probably appreciated the sentiment. She probably knew that it was from Poe, but because there wasn't anything concrete, she just kind of disregarded it after reading it and said, okay, that was nice. And now Poe is wondering like, oh man, now, you know, after a while, no response back. So he's like, all right. He decides I should probably write her a poem tailored just for her. You know, I should yeah. probably make it so that she knows that I actually know her existence. I, I can, you know, use things in the poem to really solidify the fact that I know her personally and, and I can kind of tell the story. So he writes his second titled poem to Helen. And in this poem, he would recount his first sighting of her in that rose garden. And so those roses are kind of immortalized now by at least one of Poe's poems, which is really cool. So um, he writes the poem and he sends that one to her, but he doesn't sign it. And at the time, he didn't even write a title. He didn't have a title for it. He just sent it as it was. So now Whitman receives this and she's like, OK, this is this is Poe. Um, in fact, one of her friends that were visiting her house that day when she received it, recognized the handwriting and was like, oh, that's that's Mr. Poe, uh, you know, <laughs> totally. And so now she's. Whitman being kind of reserved as she was, especially with romance, you know, she didn't reply again. She was probably just trying to keep keep the waters still, you know, yeah. <laughs> but we have to remember she kind of started it. So, you know, but I don't think she expected such a response back. So mm -hmm. she disregards this poem again. She doesn't reply to it. And, and again, she doesn't really know who it's from either. So it's not like she can write directly back to the sender, even though she kind of knows it's Poe, but um, she didn't publish anything. I think Poe probably expected her maybe to publish something again with in, in a magazine or a newspaper, you know, mm -hmm. in response, which the 
poets often did at that time. You know, they would exchange poems to one another, but just kind of publish them sometimes anonymous, anonymously, and you would, you mm -hmm. know, discover it that way. It's not like everything was direct mail to one another. So yeah, that that's really kind of a cool thing. That yeah, when you think that. about it, mm -hmm. you know, you could just mm -hmm. kind of leave it a little bit ambiguous, but yeah. so that, yeah. you know, writers still kind of knew like, oh, I know that style. I know that's to me. And they could respond back. So it was, it was an interesting kind of method, but that's how they did it. But Whitman didn't publish anything. She didn't make any, she didn't, you know, she didn't put any attention toward, towards these poems that Poe was sending. So um, finally Poe decides, all right, well, let me see if I could at least visit her i'll call on her um mm -hmm. if she's not going to reply back i'll just go see her but he was he was unsure if she was still in providence because number one she wasn't responding to his letters that he was sending to providence not to her address exactly mm -hmm. um and because he wasn't getting a response he wasn't quite sure you know is she even getting the letters you know he is she still in providence it's been three years you know um so he writes to her um, posing as an autograph collector under the pseudonym Ed uh, Edward oh, S. T. Gray, his yeah. Um, so this was a kind of a cutesy thing, but at, at this point, um, it was pretty much known that Poe was the one writing to her, and so it it was more <laughs> of a cutesy thing than anything else. But he poses as an autograph collector, sends her. Uh, a letter requesting her autograph. So she signs it, she signs her name and then sends it back. And so this was Poe's way of just, you know, uh, ensuring that she was in fact still in Providence before he bought train tickets to come yeah. down, you mm -hmm. know, and spent money on travel. So it was on uh, September of 1848. So it was a, you know, February is when the exchange started. And then finally in September of that same year, Poe comes to Providence for the second time in his life. And he calls on her at her house on Benefit Street. And so the two would meet. And the first meeting, it, it went quite well. You know, they, like Carmen, you had said earlier, they were very like-minded. You know, mm -hmm. they they were both literary critics. Uh, in fact, Whitman was considered one of the first female literary critics in the country next to Margaret Fuller. So, okay. you know, she had quite a, a stance in literature. She had a presence. And, and so they were both literary critics. They were both poets. Um, and they were both academics. You know, they, they had all sorts of ideas when it came to art and literature and religion and all those things that were current at the time and, and politics. And, and so, you know, they strolled St. John's Churchyard, which is a stop on my tour. Um, mm -hmm. And you can kind of get a, a sense of how that first date went. Um, and Poe gives her two editions of his works, which he inscribes to her on the fly leaves of each page. And and so he kind of does pretty good, you know, except he proposes marriage, <laughs> which, <laughs> come on, like... That was pretty um, quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First date, I don't know. And I, you know, my my patrons usually get a kick out of that um, because oh, yeah. it's like, Poe, what are you doing? You know, um, <laughs> Whitman was, <laughs> Whitman was at the time uh, 45 and Poe was 39. So she was about six yeah. years older than him. And I mean, that's not really, I, I mean, especially in, today's standard that's nothing and that's not and 45 isn't even old but back then it was right. kind of like uh you know Whitman's like I'm a much older woman you know my health is very frail and I just I can't be involved in a romance with you but we can definitely be you know friends and we can kind of have a friendship and we can share our literary ideas you know we have that common mm -hmm. those common interests and we can be like colleagues yeah. and friends whatever so Poe yeah, and and they had the same birthday too. Yeah, and they to, they shared the birthday. Yes, yeah. so they were both which is born on, really cool. <laughs> yeah, it is really cool. And I always thought like, oh yeah, I wonder what um, you know, what a birthday party would have looked like since they shared a birthday. <laughs> they would have probably had a huge bash. But then we did the whole Poe birthday episode, and we kind of discovered people didn't really celebrate their birthdays. <laughs> yeah, no, and then I it crushed was, your soul. Yeah, I know it, it did. It was kind of like not even a thing. So they probably didn't even really like care like she never really re 
or made any kind of special note like we shared a birthday she just it yeah could kind of wasn't even that big of a deal so yeah um <laughs> yeah so that kind of ruined that for me i'm like dang it you know uh, <laughs> that, yeah that would have been really cool to, that's right. yeah. but today we can celebrate them both on that day which is pretty yes. cool so yes um so that first date went well you know whitman of course rejects pose proposals of marriage but he continues so he would visit providence intermittently over the next three months from you know mm -hmm. september to december and the romance would just take off it would he was very persistent as we know from other romances he had and and he just mm -hmm. he didn't let up it, he he didn't very easily take no for an answer so he would yeah. be very persistent and the romance just took off from there <laughs> whether whitman liked it or not <laughs> she was pretty much tangled up with poe uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, Jeannie, for her cover picture on Zoom today, has a picture that uh, we definitely want Levi to talk about. Because yeah. I know you did some digital editing to that photo. And <laughs> yeah. so yep, and that ties to kind of toward the end of their relationship. Yeah, so that that's kind of like the stock photo I made for my website and for everything. Yeah. It shows Poe and it's Whitman. Nice. And yeah. Thank you, thank you. I like the I like the kind of I, I like the way Whitman's kind of looking at Poe from the yes. side, and and <laughs> because that was kind of like the dynamic. She was just kind of very watchful over him and what he was mm -hmm. doing, and and very careful. She tread she she you know very lightly uh, dealt with him. Uh, she had to you know, and so um, that particular photo of Whitman was taken uh about four years after the romance okay. four or five years so she was uh closer to her 50s at, the, at that point and um that particular photo of Poe which we know it today is the Whitman daguerreotype that mm -hmm. was actually taken right here in Providence so it was taken mm -hmm. in Providence and four days before that the Ultima Thule daguerreotype of Poe was taken in Providence, which would have been the first um, photo of Poe taken in Providence, and it's his most iconic. So this is one thing I like to highlight on my tour, and of course in this whole endeavor, is that Providence uh, took two of the most iconic images of Poe that we know, and he only sat six times before Degu that we know of, you know. Yeah. More photographs might surface one day, but we know that he sat six times throughout mm -hmm. his life to have an actual photograph, a daguerreotype taken. And so one third of those sittings took place here in Providence. And so mm -hmm. I'll start with the Ultima Thule since it came first, but we we might be able to post a picture of it, but I'm sure people know um, it's the most iconic. It's Poe, like full, full face view. Half mm -hmm. his face is kind of sagging to the side a little bit. Uh, very, very heavy shadows. Um, that was taken at the studio of uh, Samuel Mazarine Hartshorn um, on okay. November 9th, 1848. So just a few weeks after Poe first met Sarah Helen Whitman, you know, at her house for the first time. And it was taken four days after he attempted suicide. So, you know, people see the photograph and and they kind of you know they relish in it because oh that's poe he's dark and scary and he wrote all those horror poems and stories and that's perfect that's what we think he'd look like but that's not really what he looked like he was pretty refined he was pretty um put together most of the time but he was quite ill he was sick in that photo and it's sad today to know the context behind it and to think that it's so iconic for being such a bad photo of him and people like to associate that kind of dark and sickly look with you know someone who writes horror you know um mm -hmm. and i went um, ahead and shared thank, it there yes, we go thank you Carl. yeah that's perfect yeah. so from your website <laughs> yeah perfect another plug i love it thank you yes <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's 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 it and so um he had attempted suicide. Uh, he had acquired two ounces of laudanum, and he acquired that here in Providence. And so I have my speculations as to who provided him with that drug. Interesting. Um, yeah, there was a fellow here. He was one of Whitman's friends, but he was his name was William Jewett Pabody. And um, anyone who visits my website can look at the menu above and go to people, click mm -hmm. on him and read about him. He's a shady guy, and I think he had a lot to do with 
pose destruction uh, here in Providence, 100%. Um, and so Poe takes one ounce of this drug, which is a tincture of opiates and alcohol. And we know that, number one, alcohol already had terrible effects on Poe. So, mm -hmm. you know, already a bad bad idea. But then add the, the, the opium, opium on top of it, yeah. Poe is totally, totally intolerant to drugs. And this was the only time that we know of and that he more than likely took drugs. There was no other time Poe recreationally used drugs. He 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 did it this one time in a suicide attempt. And then, of course, Griswold perpetuated the whole myth that Poe is the, some drug addled, you know, madman, uh, you know, okay. and I, I, I wish we could erase that. You know, right. I'm not into banning books, but <laughs> I that's know, right? But that's that can we ban to, that? We can ban can that, that one. Yeah, it's pure libel. It's pure yeah. libel. Yeah, it it's terrible. And again, this is there's why no Whitman did what it. she did. You know, <laughs> she she stood up after Poe's death, and she totally refuted these things and and stood against Griswold to say, no, you're a hundred percent wrong. Yeah. So Poe takes one ounce of the drug. He he goes to Boston. And he plans to take the other ounce to end his life, ultimately. Uh, but that first ounce made him so ill that he got sick. Um, it said that he had uh, vomited up that first dose. So it, you know, it just, it didn't sit with him. Yeah. And then he was so ill that he couldn't take the second dose, which, you know, in a way, thankfully, because, you know, it probably would have had very devastating effects on him if not killed him. So, you know, mm -hmm. he ended up, sleeping off this whole thing he came back to providence and three days later engages in a night of drinking with a with a man that he met at a hotel the earl house that he was staying at in providence mm -hmm. that was actually a stone's throw from whitman's house um a man named mr mcfarland he had recognized poe as you know the great poet the the author mm -hmm. you know the the writer of the raven um and he, I think, kind of enabled Poe to, to drink a little bit. He probably bought him a drink. He was like, hey, let me, you know, buy you a drink and let's chat. And he, he was a fan, you know, and so probably not knowing what alcohol did to Poe kind of get, got him to start drinking, unfortunately. And so Poe, as we know, <laughs> started started drinking and and quickly became quite inebriated and so uh but this mcfarland guy looked after him throughout the whole night um and so the next morning convinced poe to go have his photo taken uh at mm -hmm. the studio on westminster street and so that's what produced the ultima Thule photograph so okay. um again four days after that suicide attempt the day after a, a, a night of heavy drinking i mean that's why poe looks the way he does he's not well mm -hmm. in the photo yeah. and, and it's sad it's his most infamous photo for that reason but a lot of people don't know the context behind it it's very sad that mm -hmm. that point of in poe's life he thought that ending his life would have been his best option and so yeah. he was just very depressed he was very hopeless in this at this time and and whitman you know, he believed Whitman was the one that would save him from all this yeah. doom. And in yeah. fact, right after he sat for that photograph, he walked to Whitman's house and he called on her and he, and her mother answered the door and, you know, was kind of like, all right, you know, sit here. Um, and it took Whitman two hours before she could nerve herself to see him when she finally did. Wow. He, he threw himself at her feet. He grabbed her her dress and he begged her to save him save him from some terrible impending doom and she said his voice was so appalling that it rang through the house and oh she said that he clung to her so tightly that when she kind of went to step back he tore the dress you know he was just not doing well yeah. so her mother uh had her go prepare a cup of really strong coffee for poe she thought that would kind of help with his mm -hmm. mania. Um, and so she did. And then she called a, a physician, Dr. Oki, uh, to come to the house and have a look at Poe. And so the doctor, you know, checked Poe over. He said, you know, it, it the best thing you can do is stay with a friend. Don't go back to the hotel because you might do something foolish. Mm -hmm. Stay with a friend. Have someone keep an eye on you. So William Pabody, the guy that I suspect supplied Poe with the drugs, 
took Poe into his home. So I don't know how well of an idea that how good of an yeah. idea that was, but that's what happened. Pavity looked over Poe over the next few days. Um, and he he recovered. He recovered from this because four days after that photograph was taken and all that stuff happened, he sat for the for the Whitman daguerreotype, which we see yeah. in Jeannie's picture. And, yeah. and this shows a much more refined, kind of put together, healthier looking Poe. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, this was his favorite image of himself. He said this was the best and most authentic likeness of himself that he had ever sat for. So, yeah. um, and it is, it's my favorite picture of him. I actually have it tattooed on my arm. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's, he's shown with his frock coat from West Point, the coat that he kept from all, his whole time. And it, you know, from my cat's distracting me at the door, meowing. I don't know if you can hear that, but. <laughs> that clown. Um, uh, I think it's the new kitty, Greenwood. <laughs> oh, Greenwood. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he's he's a, a little bit of a menace. That's why he's not allowed in the room right now. He'd be chewing wires and everything. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so he, he's, he sits for that photograph and it's thought to be an engagement gift to Sarah Helen Whitman, because okay. some, at some point between the Ultima Thule photograph and this photograph, she had finally agreed to marry him. So he had sat for this photo. It's the only one that he actually commissioned himself and paid for himself. All his other photographs were taken by, uh, other people who convinced him to go have it taken and someone else had paid for it. This okay. one. He paid for, he sat for on uh, on his own merit. It was on his own accord. And he said it was the best likeness of him ever taken. So Providence mm -hmm. captured Poe at his absolute worst and his absolute best, which yes. I think is pretty interesting and pretty iconic in itself because, I mean, what none of the other Poe cities can say, oh, well, you know, we took this icon. You know, Poe did sat, sit for other photographs, but none right. so iconic as these two. So that's yeah. another and so close play. together yeah and so close together yeah. yeah i don't think we in any of Poe's photographs do we have ones that were taken just days apart you know all the other daguerreotypes mm -hmm. were taken within years um right and there are some i know when he sat for the thompson and he sat for the annie two different plates were made so that one sitting produced two different images, but they're only slightly different. The pose yeah. was only a little bit changed. So I don't know. That doesn't really count to me. This was, this yeah, shows two I agree. very different yeah. sides of Poe over, you know, just a few days. So mm -hmm. Whitman agrees to marry Poe finally. And it was, you know, a few within a month, I think is a fair amount of time that from when she first they first started their whole thing to when she finally mm -hmm. agreed to marry him because he of course was persistent and there were conditions though there were conditions set to that marriage of course the engagement um one was that you know he stopped drinking and the other was that she get her mother who hated poe who said she'd rather see her daughter dead <laughs> than married to poe mm -hmm. um she she wanted her mother to consent to the union so Poe, Whitman, they were both happy with these. Poe vowed sobriety. And so they, they they planned to wed sometime in December, but they hadn't set a date just yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there, there's another place in Rhode Island that it's probably one of, it, it might be my favorite place uh, that I visited actually before I knew you or anything the first time my <laughs> husband and I went to Rhode Island in Providence and that's the Athenaeum and yes. so if do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah. it's it is such a neat place I I just I I felt like Poe and you know Sarah Helen Whitman were around me going yeah. in there it just it's so cool yeah you really do feel their presence it's it's incredible the Athenaeum is uh the fourth oldest library in the country mm -hmm. um it was established in 1836 it was a they they operated as a member funded library that was open to the public and they still mm -hmm. run under that same model so anybody is free to visit the library go inside you know look at the books uh look at the art um but you have to be a member to be able to check a book out okay and so those memberships are what op essentially fund the library to keep it open but mm -hmm. um 
this library served as kind of a little hideaway for Poe and Whitman during their courtship. And when you go inside and you look, um, you can see why. I mean, you think two Victorian authors, poets, where where would be a nice place for them to have a romance? <laughs> look at the Athenaeum. It's beautiful. It's um yeah. And so they spent a lot of time there. And so the Athenaeum has a number of tangible artifacts that relate to Poe and Whitman, but mm -hmm. also they have some oral history that is quite interesting when it comes to Poe and Whitman in the library. So one story that's really fun, um, that is a good example of both, is that um, Whitman and Poe were at the Athenaeum one morning, um, and Whitman had read Ulalum, and as we know, that was one of Poe's poems, but he had published it in the American Whig Review uh, anonymously. So she was infatuated with this poem. She loved it. She loved the language, the mood. Um, this was just <laughs> right up her alley. Um, and so she had asked all her friends, um, everybody she knew, you know, have you read the poem? Do you know who the author is? And everyone just kind of shook their head. You know, no one knew it was anonymous. I'm sure people had their guesses and I'm sure a lot of them did guess Poe, but still <laughs> they were unsure. So while they were in Poe and Whitman were in the library that morning, she had asked him, you know, Edgar, do you know that poem Ulalum in the American Review? You know, do, have you read it? What are your thoughts? Without saying a word, Poe very humbly turns to the <laughs> turns in the alcove where they were sitting to the shelf. He pulls the volume, the American Review, off the shelf. He opens up to the poem and with a pencil signs his name at the bottom, defacing <laughs> one of their library books. Um, but this was his very romantic and, as I said, humble way of just letting Sarah Helen Whitman know that I'm the author. Yes. So, you know, it's just like <laughs> such a Poe thing to do. And so the Athenaeum, of course, today are very, very, very happy that he did deface one of their library books. Yes. Oh my um, gosh. It's one of their most treasured artif artifacts, excuse me. Yeah. Um, in fact, that, that very volume, it stayed on the shelf for 20 years. So wow. 20 years after the romance, um, Whitman was corresponding with John Henry Ingram, one of Poe's early biographers, real mm -hmm. biographers. Um, and she recalls this happening. So she's like, and she had kind of forgotten about it, but you know, the conversation about her romance with Poe prompted her to remember this little anecdote. So she went to the library, mm -hmm. which is right next to her house. You know, all these stops are within a mile with in, in each other, yeah. which makes for a perfect walking tour. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, Just you got the hills, you got yeah, the hills. The, uh, plug, plug. Uh, it makes a great walking tour. No. Yes, um, it does. So <laughs> She goes back to the library. She finds the volume, uh, opens up to the poem, and sure enough, lightly etched in pencil, his signature is still there. So she's like, oh, this is perfect. So she mm -hmm. gives it to the librarians. And, you know, of course, at that point, you know, by the 1870s, Poe's fame was pretty much solidified at mm -hmm. that point. And his, you know, he was a well-known internationally and, and worldwide. I mean, he was well known so the Athenaeum were like oh wow you know they were so thrilled to have this and so since that day they have kept it in their special collection so you can view it by appointment or mm -hmm. you know sometimes they they do display it in their exhibit room yeah. um and I just think it's so amazing that not only the artifact and the story but also the fact that Sarah Helen Whitman herself was the one that like went back to the library yes. pulled it off the shelf to find it and saw that it was there and from her hands to the librarians, they have kept it yes. in their special collection. So it's just another role that Whitman played in Poe's overall legacy and how we remember yeah. him and, and how we can celebrate him today and see these things. And it's just amazing. So I love I love telling that story. But if, yeah, if you're I, ever- Yeah, I love that one. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's a good one. It's like one of their favorite ones too. Um, mm -hmm. And so of course the Athenaeum is always a great place to visit if you're around and of course if you come on the tour we we visit um and in 2019 um if if you ever have seen pictures of the athenaeum or have been there you know they have like a pantheon of busts of all famous faces you yes. know they have byron they have franklin and um washington and dante they have 
all you know the most notable thinkers and, and people of the time, but they never had Edgar Allan Poe, and he was their most famous visitor. So mm -hmm. um, in 2019, I had conspired with them since I own a copy of Quinn's bust, Life Size mm -hmm. Bust of Poe, to have another copy made, and they have have it now displayed above their entryway so that they could also include Poe within you know their pantheon of famous faces and and thinkers so now when you enter and exit the library poe is right above you looking down and you know that's you amazing remember his time you know in the city and i'm that was that was one thing i was very happy to contribute to to help bring poe's legacy kind of back to providence a absolutely and i know kind of going back to uh Ula Loom, i know virginia that's one of her absolute favorites mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good and it's, one. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a beautiful one, and it's it's really funny. Um, when Levi and I started our journey in the podcast together, yeah, admittedly, Sarah was someone from that realm that I didn't know a whole lot about, but I knew he was going to be a great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll tell you about her. <laughs> great teacher. I was like, all right, tell me about your girl. Yeah, because right. I don't know nothing about her. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I knew she was a poet and I knew there was a period of time where, you know, he had spent time with her and he had been there. But beyond that, I really didn't know, like, yeah, the nooks right. and crannies, so yeah. to speak, yeah, in the, the same way that Levi it. does. Yeah. yeah. And I was just like so taken aback. And so when I learned that she was obsessed with Ula Loom, I'm like, you know, I know. <laughs> I know I have a lot in common with my namesake, but I feel a big connection to this woman too, because mm -hmm. I mean, like I'm in my garden at night. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I like to wear all white during the summer and I'm in all black the rest of the time. And yes. I love to wear head scarves. What's going on here? I was like, yeah. okay. So I've got this other connect. Like, and it's funny how it, there's there's things that have been discussed here that in uh, in the next month or so it's all going to come together, um, but it's it's amazing how small how large everything is, but how small everything is at the yeah. same time, and yeah. how there's all this connection. And Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's it just yeah, yeah, so, and and honestly, truly, like if it were not for her we probably wouldn't have a lot because so in especially during the early 1800s there wasn't a whole lot of record keeping in the same way yeah. um that we saw it towards the latter half of the 1800s mm -hmm. um and so because of her we and and letters and correspondences because we know that that Eddie didn't keep a, a diary or anything like that you know yeah. we we have chunks here and there you know mm -hmm. or letters from you know from mariah that you know talk about what's going on with the kids yeah, <laughs> you know, right. so, yeah. Speak. so yeah. we have that but we don't like but sarah really like she she kept great she records kept it, I've, yes. great records <laughs> i've been through all of them at oh. the john hey i mean that's what's another amazing part of what i've been able to do is uh personally handle and and read through and flip through her notes and her letters and her manuscripts and compile this history firsthand from the from the woman who lived it and she did she kept everything she kept scraps mm -hmm. she made scrap books one thing i always find uh clever about whitman is that she she would color code her notes so that Wow. Um, certain things are in blue or red crayon in that mm -hmm. she would circle and make little annotations some and they meant different things it's like she was so like in her head yeah it was just amazing and so she just kept this amazing record of everything and anything poe and she gave these resources to everybody who inquired that was the other thing too she didn't hoard all the information and she didn't you know not talk to people like some of the other Poe women did like Marie Louise Shu didn't really say much after her mm -hmm. time with Poe and mm -hmm. even Elmira nope. Royster didn't she yeah. kept very quiet yes um so and and Annie Richmond 
a little more so she was a little bit more vocal about her romance with poe or yeah. romance. i say romance friendship but it was a romance but it, yeah. you know yeah it's always complicated but um sarah helen whitman was like the only one that was actually using materials and and um her resources to spread the information about Poe and the accurate information about Poe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, biographers were appealing to her for her aid and helping them compile their biographies. And so she was giving them materials and articles and things published about Poe. And she would also stay up to date with all the current publications and articles about Poe and, and say, and she was able to decipher and, and tell biographers, hey, this article totally wrong like that the author got it wrong like that's not right that's not right but this one yes this is totally mm -hmm. great uh use this one you know she would help sift through the information to really bring the most accurate accounts of poe's life and times and his works to light so without her doing all that i don't know i think a lot of that misinformation would have slipped through the cracks yeah you know because not many other <laughs> people in poe's life were do actually doing that to that extent even maria clem yeah. i mean mm -hmm. she was she was writing to people and and staying you know uh in in correspondence with people but she wasn't publishing things she wasn't you know right uh, criticizing articles and things you know publicly to say this is right this is wrong um she wasn't in, like an academic like whitman was so whitman mm -hmm. was gave us that first like she was like the first post scholar you know in a way yeah yeah in, in a mm -hmm. lot of ways and so without her work in that that you know, that foundation that she made, who knows where we'd be today. We, we'd probably be a lot farther behind than I, we are. Yeah, I agree. Her, you know? It'd be even more mystery. Right. Yeah, and <laughs> it's one of those things that it just, not that the uh, the other women in his life, you know, the, the his romances, that they didn't love him or care for him, right. you know, that way. But it just shows that even though, her romance with Poe didn't work out. He didn't live up to, you know, the, you know, being in the temperance, you know, mm -hmm. part of the, the um, guidelines. She said that he fell that one time. She still respected him, the man, the poet, the writer, right. and wanted his legacy to live on because she knew how great he was and it just mm -hmm. kind of shows that the depth of how much she probably really cared for him exactly. and that's really well said you know. well and correct me if i'm wrong levi and and this is just something that i've been meaning to talk to you about um because it's something i've been thinking a lot about mm -hmm. um because of some personal things but um knowing that she had been widowed and had been widowed for so long mm -hmm. and knowing that you know he was recently a widower you know right. there's a lot grief does weird things to people and yeah, right. it affects everybody a little bit differently and mm -hmm. for some folks they get through it faster yeah right. and for others it takes <laughs> years yeah. Yeah. or never years. goes away or never, or never, yeah. never yeah. goes away yeah, goes yeah. Away. right yeah and and, and, and then you have moments where, you know, you have a pretty, pretty good stretch of time where you're like, mm -hmm. I'm okay. Yeah. And other days it hits you hard, but yeah. I, I feel that she probably, and, and this is of course, this is just me going, you know, I wonder if part of their connection is she understood what he was going through. Yeah. She understood that loss. Mm -hmm. And probably didn't look at him as some crazy man. Yeah. Like she, right. she knew, she knew what was happening with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I feel yeah. like, I feel like some of that caring came from that. I, because I think that that's was a not very, that long after. Yeah. Virginia, that's a very valid point. Yeah. And I never really considered that, but I think you're totally right. I think she mm -hmm. certainly empathized with Poe's suffering at that time and, mm -hmm. and, instead of just kind of brushing him off and, and kind of shooing him away because he was so frantic, she was trying to understand his grief and help him through it, even if it yeah. meant that she would have to kind of be almost part of his heart heartache in a way because, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, he, but she knew what was going to be best for him and for her. Mm -hmm. And I think she was just more or less trying to be that kind of 
watchful friend, you know, that person to be like, hey, I'll be with you through this and, you know, I'll give you the hard answers, but I'll also give you the the soft answers too. And I'll kind of nurture you and, mm-hmm. and care for you yeah. through this because yeah, she, she was widowed uh, very young. She was only 30 and she was, she was, you know, widowed and, and um, you know, she never remarried and she had a few suitors even before Poe um mm-hmm. and after <laughs> men that wanted her <laughs> hand but she was like oh, no no i don't know if she ever really intended to get married again you know mm-hmm. um her first marriage you know to john winslow whitman um he was just a very impractical man and so you know he went to prison for for a brief time during their marriage because he signed a bad check you know um mm-hmm. he set his um dean's haystacks on fire at brown university as a as like a college prank and almost got arrested (laughs) for that but fled providence before he could like he was just this crazy kind of impractical dude but she was young you know and she was still finding her way and i think Mm -hmm. this kind of unexpected and tragic death kind of put it into perspective for her like okay i kind of had my run and now i really have to make sure i if I'm to get married again, I choose the right one, you know, and yeah. then here you have Poe comes along and he's just so adamant, you know, I, I don't, if Poe wasn't as tenacious as he was to win her yeah. hand, it would have been over and done with fairly soon. You know, she would have yeah. kept a correspondence, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't have um, entertained it for as long as she was and even agreed to a marriage on con- certain conditions if he wasn't just so persistent. So yeah, yeah, I think there's such a, you know, uh, accumulation of things that I think was kind of going into both of their mindsets in this whole romance. And, you know, but my thinking is, yeah, I think she, she probably did really empathize with him and kind of understand like this guy's really going through it and he needs a friend. He doesn't need a critic. He doesn't need, you know, maybe not even a wife, not even a woman, just yeah. a friend, a, a person to really help him, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we have probably... I know this might have to be a two-part thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, what, what what are we on now? I mean, yeah. It's... Oh, I think we're only a little over an hour. A little okay. over an hour. So, so. I, could, I could probably just give you the, the ending because... Um, yes. Yeah. We, we need to let them know that let our viewers and listeners right, know the ending. Yes. Right. We, we don't want to leave too much of a cliffhanger, but essentially, uh, Poe met the condition of not drinking, of mm-hmm. course, and she was able to convince her mother to consent to the union, but she had to forfeit her inheritance, which she did. She forfeited that inheritance. She signed over. It was like five thousand in cash and sixty different savings bonds and stocks which in today's money it equates to well over a hundred and eighty four thousand dollars so it was a hefty yeah it was a hefty sum of money she was signing over but her mother didn't want poe getting his hands on her money after they were married because i think that's what she mainly thought his motive was was just to kind of get at her family wealth Mm -hmm. and so they planned to wed on christmas Christmas Day, 1848, but just two days before then, um, an anonymous note was passed to Sarah Helen Whitman while she was at the Athenaeum, and Mm -hmm. the note informed her that Poe was seen drinking at his hotel, that he had called for a glass of wine, he was seen intoxicated, he broke his vow, um, the wedding was off, you know, and I don't think it was so much so that she believed the note, because um, we don't actually know if it was true or not. Poe claims he, he, he hadn't had anything to drink and he tried to explain this to her and i don't think it was that she believed that he had a drink i think it was the scrutiny that she just kept facing from her friends and family that she said this Mm -hmm. wedding cannot be and it will never be we can never be because it's just you know and poe even said to whitman in a letter kind of earlier on in in their romance but it kind of was foreshadowing that you know he told her that you know helen i see that uh, my friend or uh, your friends are not my own and so yeah. he kind of knew that she was surrounded by people mm-hmm. that didn't approve of him so yeah um she broke off the union um he left providence in fact her mother kicked him out of the house <laughs> as he pleaded with her to you know reconsider 
and mm-hmm. uh, he went back to New York and they never saw each other again. Um, he wrote to her a month later, very he in, in a very cold letter. He kind of addressed her very coldly as Madam and Mrs. W, very like formal oh, wow. kind of, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, that was it. And so she didn't reply. She figured, you know, this let's not stir him up again. Let's just let mm-hmm. this let the dust settle. Um, but of mm-hmm. course, he died. 10 months after that and you know yeah. she never got that closure but again she would spend the next 30 years you know vindicating him and 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 um publishing multiple things articles and even a book in 1860 t- titled mm-hmm. edgar poe and his critics um, yeah to kind of bring the truth to light about him his character and his true genius and so she yeah. did just that and to her dying day you know she was corresponding with Poe's biographers having her caretakers transcribe uh letters for her you know she wow. was she was tenacious she was really tenacious mm-hmm. um she helped Mallarmé translate the raven into french because she was uh bilingual well multilingual she she spoke french german latin of course english um and so she helped Mallarmé um translate the raven into french bringing Poe's works abroad because mm-hmm. in europe i mean he was he was becoming more popular in Europe than he was in America. You know, Europe kind of appreciated mm-hmm. all of him and all of his yeah. genius first after his death. And then America kind of got the hint and was like, oh yeah, he's ours. He's he's our native right. son, Let's, you know. <laughs> and so then America took, oh. took on, but Whitman aided in bringing Poe's works yeah. abroad. And so, you know, so not only do we owe her for her work here within the States, but you know across the Mm -hmm. ocean it's it's amazing Mm -hmm. you know her i could go on and on about her obviously um yeah (laughs) but it's just her work was just unmatched when it came to to poe yeah we we owe her a lot and absolutely and she just she's such a neat lady like i i knew a little bit about her when i did the tour with you and i you know at the end i was like levi i've learned so much And it's like, it it just, it's, it's exciting that, you know, there's so much out there that you can read and read and read and still not know everything. And so, oh yeah, I know. And I learned that firsthand. It's especially with Whitman, you know, the general biographies of Poe don't even scratch the surface when it comes to Whitman. And even what I've talked about on this podcast in this hour doesn't even, I have so much more I could talk about with Whitman and the things that she did and practice, you know, it, it goes on and on, but, um, yeah, I like to say that a lot of people on my tour, they come for Poe, of course, but then they leave with Whitman, you know, mm-hmm. they leave with this right. new figure in their head, like, oh, wow, this, this woman was incredible. And, and I had no idea, you know, and yeah. so that's kind of been one of my greatest, albeit inadvertent achievements is kind of highlighting her <laughs> through all of this too. So I can kind of mm-hmm. spread Poe's legacy and the truth about Poe and just his life and his works, but also highlight Sarah Helen Whitman and kind of bring her to people's, you know, bookshelves. You know, I hope it encourages people to kind of pursue her works and her life and her writing, Mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah, I I totally agree. Well, we're so happy, happy, happy that you guys did this collaboration with us. This has been a lot of fun. Um, Yeah. Hopefully I didn't, you know, ramble on for too long but no this is oh a topic goodness, no. near and dear to my heart no. obviously so i'm yeah, glad you, we could kind of collab on this and, and yes you are the expert you know i <laughs> i i kind of read up on just you know sarah <laughs> helen whitman rhode island and things like that but you know i we knew going into this you would be able to share so much with everybody and we appreciate that so much well thank you so much i appreciate yeah. the outlet to do so <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and also, just to point out that Rhode Island is no longer known as the sewer, but the ocean <laughs> oh, state. The ocean, that's <laughs> right. Ocean that is on our yeah. license yes. plate. I yes. might yes. petition to have it changed back to sewer, though. <laughs> yeah, that's more fun. <laughs> it does have oh. a lot of people living there. There's, what, like oh. three times the amount of people living in Rhode Island than in Wyoming. So, we're, okay. yeah, we're very condensed, condensedly yes. populated. Yeah. For a yes. little tiny so, state. Well, and yeah. I think Levi, when I was there uh, for the tour, I think I told you that at one point I, I was I was pretty young, maybe six or seven. I may have the date wrong, 
but uh, my dad was almost transferred to Rhode Island with his job. And I, I think about it now and I'm like, man, what would my life be like if we had moved right. to pro- pro- most likely wow. Providence? Because he traveled up there periodically for his job. So huh, it's just, it's, I, so I've always, I've always thought of, it, it's just a neat little, you know, connection just with my dad that ooh, yeah. I could have lived there, <laughs> grew <That's> up there. <laughs> crazy. And you yeah. would have beat me to the punch. Maybe with the, with the, yes. with the tour, yeah. you would have stole my whole spotlight because you would have been the, the Poe Whitman person in Providence. And what would I have been? I would have been like, dang it. Oh gosh. <laughs> so maybe everything happens for a reason. <laughs> it does. It absolutely does. Well, that yes. is cool. That is cool. Yeah. So that, yeah, with me staying here, we've got, there's not really a Poe connection in Tennessee, except for like, you know, Andrew Jackson with King Pest. But, you know, Jeannie and I, I guess, can be the connection to help, you know, right. Keep yeah. showing the connections everywhere. Yeah, so. exactly. That in itself yeah. is, right. is the connection, you know, you're yeah, the outlet. Absolutely. So that's, yes. that's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, well, we thank you guys so much. And uh, one thing we want to also tell, remind everybody is the poetry reading event is March 30th from 10 to 4 um, Central Standard Time. And then the poetry contest opens up for submissions on April 1st. And it, you're not an April Fool if you submit your poem that day. And that, that link will be live on our website, sixdegreesofpoe.com, and click on the tab the Poet Like Poe Poetry Contest. That's a hard thing to say fast. <laughs> And Virginia and Levi will be doing yeah, yeah. readings on the reading event. So we are I can't wait. Yeah. Yes. and judges and judges. Yes. So. And judges for the poetry contest again. Yes. So we're excited for all of that. So I guess at this point, if everybody will join in, we are out. We're getting better. (laughs) Forever near thee, soul in soul, near thee forever yet how far, may our lives reach love's perfect goal in the high order of thy star.